Okay. okay. Uh, uh, is anybody expected or shall we go ahead? So we, we, we may start. All right. Okay. Okay. Very good then. And uh, with Ambassador Raghavan's permission, uh, if if you permit us, sir, we'll start. I'll just say a few words by way of introduction. Yes. And then I'll hand it over to you. I just also wanted to make a small logistical uh, sort of uh, forewarning, which is that our paid subscription has still run into has run into some glitches. So every 50 minutes we are going to get cut off. So, but we, you know there are three links that you must have received. So we uh, just keep going. The point is there'll be a little break after every 50 minutes. So. Uh, uh, I, I, I mean, I apologize in advance for that, uh, but if everyone knows that this is what is going to happen, that 50 minutes, like around 3.50 will get cut off, then we press the second link and then we are back on. So essentially you, you can just keep speaking across that break and whenever you finish, then we will take the Q&A. So that's the normal procedure. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to say that we are, we are so delighted and honored that you could join us in this webinar series, which is our, uh, you might say, uh, you know, battle against the pandemic when we cannot have live events at Shimla in this uh, very important venue, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So we decided that at least we would start a webinar series and uh, think about a post-COVID world and uh, India's place in it. And that's why uh, we've also veered, uh, you know, almost perilously close to uh, contemporary issues, policy, if not politics, which is not our usual habit because we do research, you know, which is not entirely linked with uh, topical events or trends. But this time, given that the whole world seems to be in a kind of churn. We were very keen to try to reconceptualize this. And I'm happy to say that we've had uh, a series of wonderful webinars in the past, one on China. In fact, when we were almost eyeball to eyeball, uh, you know, on our frontiers in Ladakh, uh, uh, near the, the Pangjong Sao Lake and so forth with Sayyid Atta Hasnan. Then we had one on the uh, you know, prospects of uh, Indo-US relations with uh, Mr. Navtet Sarma. And uh, then we had other uh, topics, including a wonderful uh, webinar by uh, Dr. Shekhar Mande, who heads the CSIR on uh, you know, the future of science and technology in India. And another one actually by uh, um, Professor Radhavala Tripathi, who, who talked about a, a wonderful debate uh, between Dan and Saraswati and uh, the so-called Sanatanis about uh, whether or not the Vedas sanctioned uh, idol worship, among other things. But so we've had a very vibrant uh, webinar series and, and we're so glad that we can now look slightly west to our neighbors, a significant other, you might call them, you know, frenemies, more enemies than friends. But it's a very complex relationship, and I can't think of anybody better than you to lead us through it. Uh, I must uh, uh, tell our scholars and fellows and other uh, people listening in that uh, Ambassador Raghavan served with great distinction twice in Pakistan. He, in fact, retired as our high commissioner there in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. But he had an earlier stint as the deputy high commissioner. I have it written down somewhere. Yes, 2003 to 2007. So he's really, really in the best position to tell us about this extremely complex and fractious relationship that we have with Pakistan. I also wanted to say that uh, Ambassador Raghavan, in the best traditions of our foreign service, is a scholar. He's a PhD from JNU in history. He's the author of three really fine books of which I have actually uh, I'm familiar with two of them. The first is called Attendant Lords, Bairam Khan and Abdur Rahim, who were courtiers and poets in Mughal India. This book was published um, um, a couple of years ago, three, four years ago. And the next book, which I have, in fact, I was reading it last night, 
uh, was called The People Next Door, The Curious History of India's Relations with Pakistan. I'm going to say a few words about this book. Uh, um, uh, and the third book, the third book which came out just last year is called History Men, Jadunath Sarkar, G.S. Sardesai, Raghubir Singh, and the Quest for India's Past. Uh, and currently, uh, Ambassador Raghavan is the Director General of the Indian Council of World Affairs. Now, as you all know, the Indian Council of World Affairs is older than independent India. In fact, it was formed, if I am not uh, wrong, in the 40s. And, you know, our, our first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, took a great interest in it. And there was an Asian Relations Conference which was held there prior to independence in 1946. So it's a very, very distinguished and uh, hallowed institution of which he's the head. And I happen to be on their uh, academic committee also aboard. So uh, I just want to say one or two more things uh, before I hand it over to, to Dr. Raghavan. Can you hear me, Dr. Raghavan? I, I seem to have uh, lost. No, I can, I can hear you. I can hear you very clearly. Okay, fantastic. So I, I just wanted, with your permission, to say a few words about your fine book, The People Next Door. Uh, and uh, I think it's a very readable account of, uh, as I said, India's extremely complex and fractious relationship with Pakistan. And uh, the history of this relationship, of course, uh, in some ways is deeply tied up with the Viceregal Lodge uh, in whose premises the Indian Institute of Advanced Study was uh, formed by President Radhakrishnan because the Radcliffe line was drawn hereabouts. Of course, uh, we have a small uh, historical section, a museum section here, a few rooms which we have restored. But uh, we've got a table here, believed to be the table on which Radcliffe drew the line in blue pencil. But apparently he sat more often at the United Services Club, closer to the mall. Be that as it may, uh, the Radcliffe line is, of course, uh, the basis of the partition of India and Pakistan. And in your book, you mentioned it, you also mentioned the Duran line, especially in connection with Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, who complained that the Pakhtuns were divided twice, once by the British and then again, you know, by the Pakistan-India division. So that line also features, and the McMahon line, the third line, all blood-soaked lines featured in our earlier webinar. But it's a very readable account, I thought, and it, it also highlights several very interesting individuals. One of them is Rahmat Ali, who in the 30s is credited with uh, naming uh, Pakistan, you know, uh, based on its uh, different provinces. That features in your book. It's a fascinating account of this man, uh, Rahmat Ali, uh, who later is sent back to Cambridge by Jinnah. He falls out with Jinnah. You mention all of that in your book. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, Rahmat Ali uh, had other plans for a further balkanization of uh, India so that uh, all the Muslim, uh, you know, communities within, uh, you know, the divided India or in those days, of course, it was undivided, would also have the sovereignty. So you mentioned, uh, so I, I'll quote from your book, the sovereignization of Muslims of India by in national states. And of course, Punjab, Afghan, Istan, Kashmir, Sindh, and Baluchistan, P, A, K, S, and Stan, of course, make up uh, Pakistan. Uh, and of course, uh, so, uh, Rahmat Ali had this proposal of the continent of Dinya. You know, the Bay of Bengal states would be called Bangay Islam. Then uh, uh, South, you know, he had another state, if I remember right, you're mentioning in your book, Osmanistan, I think, uh, comprising of Hyderabad and the Deccan, Hyderistan, Uttar Pradesh, Siddiquistan, Central Provinces, Farukhistan, Bihar and Orissa, uh, and... Uh, Muinistan of Rajasthan, Maplistan uh, in the Mopla areas of, uh, of uh, Kerala and so forth. Now, why I mention this is that you say in your book that uh, the history of Indo-Pak relations is characterized, you know, by a tension between doves and hawks on both sides. 
So Rahmat Ali was a hawk on their side of the story, though, you know, instead of Qayyad Islam, he I think you mentioned how he was called Quizzling Islam. He called, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, um, he Azam. Sorry, not Islam. Quizzling a Azam instead of Qayyad Azam. He called Jinnah that for betraying the interests of Indian Muslims. So you have a, 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 an interesting character like Rahmat Ali on that side. And on our side, we have, you know, several hawks who, who want Akhanda Bharat, obviously. And in between, there are so many other types of fascinating characters which feature in your book, sir. These include Muhammad Yunus, a man called Goba, who wrote these sensational books. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, uh, you know, other fascinating characters, you know, you know, you weave their story in and out of uh, this this fine book uh, that you've written. So uh, I, I would recommend this book. I have an e-copy. I have a Kindle copy, so I can't show it. I mean, you mentioned Mangat Rai, who married, I think, Nayantara Sehgal, Azim Hussain, uh, who joined the Punjab cadre. In fact, uh, General Atta Hasnan, who came here, was also... Uh, narrating to us how his cousin was a general on the other side and they were fighting during Kargil and uh, you know he didn't uh, he was telling me these anecdotes you know on both sides of the border so your book is is a very rich uh, history of the people involved including wonderful people who served at high, as high commissioners Rajeshwar Dayal who went on to become foreign secretaries uh, so all these all these people are characters in your book so I really recommend it to our fellows. And uh, uh, as, a, as a last point, I must say that uh, to all our fellows here that, uh, you know, when I served as the inaugural uh, chair in, in uh, South Asian studies at the National University of Singapore, Ambassador Raghavan was my boss uh, because, uh, you know, my salary came from the government of India through ICCR, though, of course, I was teaching at NUS. So, uh, I had an official passport. So after I joined, I, I went to the High Commission. India's High Commission is on Grange Road, just off Orchard Road, you know, between Orchard and Somerset, if you know your Singapore. And it's a wonderful place. And, uh, you know, so I got invited to all the functions there. And the, you know, the Independence Day celebrations in Singapore is an eye-opener. Thousands of people come there. And if you want to understand the idea of India being more powerful, possibly, than just the state of India. You have to go there on Independence Day and see the energy of the people in, in their belief all over that region for what India stands for. And Ambassador Raghavan had such a distinguished tenure there. So anyhow, I went there in the first week, I went and reported to him. And I said, sir, uh, do you have any instructions for me? So he said, are you kidding? I mean, you're free. I mean, you teach uh, whatever you like. And then he paused for a moment and he said, you know, but don't say anything that will embarrass your country or you. And then he smiled and he said, you know what, if you have an occasional parking ticket or something, just let us know. We'll take care of it <laughs> because, you know, we had some sort of diplomatic immunity. So those were wonderful days of, uh, you know, our ambassador there, a scholar uh, and a great diplomat. So with these words, I welcome you, sir. Thank you for joining us. It's all yours. I'm muting my mic. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paranjpe, for having invited me. Uh, I know about the Indian Institute of Advanced Study for many years. I've visited, I've visited its uh, absolutely magnificent uh, premises. Uh, and I'm very grateful that I can join you even if it is virtually, but I will take you up on that invitation for visiting at some uh, stage. And thank you also for that very generous introduction. I also recall our days in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, thank you for referring to all my books. And I really look forward to this interaction with your very distinguished uh, uh, colleagues uh, on a subject which uh, uh, is obviously of great interest and about which there is a great deal of knowledge in India. So I don't have to go into too much uh, uh, detail. Uh, I really look upon this as an opportunity for sharing some, uh, uh, sharing some thoughts. And when one is with such a distinguished uh, uh, academic uh, community, 
Uh, it is also good to stretch one's thoughts in whichever direction they, uh, they lead to. So I address these remarks in, uh, uh, in that spirit. As you mentioned, India and Pakistan's uh, relations uh, have always been fractious. In a year and a half or two years, we will shortly be approaching 75 years uh, of both our independent uh, uh, nationhoods. And while in these past 75 years, so much has changed in our region uh, and in the world around us, but it would be true to say that uh, India-Pakistan relations, despite uh, brief periods of optimism, very brief periods of optimism, uh, on the whole, uh, have been in a state uh, which is uh, extremely tense, extremely fractious, uh, and on the whole, most unsatisfactory uh, from the sense of uh, from uh, from the sense of that neighbor should have reasonably stable uh, relations. Now, this long stretch of uh, bad relations with an immediate uh, neighbor uh, places an enormous burden on uh, diplomacy. Because apart from the normal diplomacy, uh, the, the meat of diplomacy, uh, what your foreign policy has to deal with uh, is a huge burden of uh, frustration, cynicism, uh, and and the sense more than anything else that there is something exceptionally there's something exceptional about India Pakistan relations which condemns uh, the relationship to stay in this uh, very very bad state uh, for such a long period of time it's almost like a genetic problem or a DNA problem uh, and of course there is a great deal of science uh, about the nature of the DNA problem uh, between India and Pakistan, and uh, many people have written about it, uh, about uh, structural identity issues in uh, in uh, in Pakistan, Hello. about uh, uh, chronic uh, cartographic anxieties, uh, uh, and so on. So there's there are structural uh, issues quite apart from uh, more obvious uh, territorial uh, issues such as Jammu and Kashmir and, uh, and so on. Um, so I'd like to begin with this, that is there actually a genetic, a genetic uh, problem, uh, a DNA problem, uh, which leads to almost a kind of predisposition to a deeply suboptimal relationship? between mm -hmm. India and Pakistan. And I think to understand this, we don't need to sink ourselves into India-Pakistan mythology totally, but have to look at the world around us. Uh, and when you look at the world around us, you realize that poor relations between neighboring countries is not exceptional. If you look at the situation uh, today, you have a major, uh, major, possibly a major situation developing between uh, Greece and Turkey, even a somewhat placid relationship within ASEAN uh, uh, as between Malaysia and Singapore uh, has flared up over the issue of uh, Sawak, which not many people know about, but nevertheless, for Malaysians and Filipinos, it's a deeply emotional uh, and divisive uh, issue. Uh, you have, uh, Israel and some of its Arab neighbors, you have North and South uh, uh, Korea, you have Japan and uh, uh, China, and there are numerous other uh, examples. I think the first point to understand is that the most challenging issues uh, for any country's diplomacy are the neighborhood issues. So we should not by uh, any means uh, sink into a kind of India-Pakistan exceptionalism that there's something totally different about us, which uh, leads to this predisposition to uh, a bad relationship uh, with a major neighbor. The point is that neighboring country relationships are difficult. The challenge for your diplomacy, the test for your diplomacy is how you manage those, uh, uh, manage those difficulties. Now, 
by no means should one try to minimize the difficulties involved. Because the other peculiar thing about neighboring country relationships uh, is that you cannot address them in a linear fashion and expect results. So there's no, there's no silver bullet. There's no easy magic bullet. You can't say that if uh, India and Pakistan suddenly start trading with each other, if trade increases, the political differences will disappear. The world doesn't work like that. We have a huge amount of trade with Nepal, but that doesn't mean that you don't have all the uh, issues which neighboring countries have vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Nepal. Uh, Japan and China have uh, huge amounts of trade and investment, enormous people-to-people -people contact in terms of tourism and so on. But I doubt if you can say that they have overcome uh, the history of their own past conflicts or the identity issues which those conflicts have uh, uh, gendered and consolidated uh, for decades and uh, uh, centuries. And again, there are many other examples of this kind. That There, there are no easy linear solutions uh, in neighboring country relationships. There's no substitute for the hard uh, grind of uh, hard grind of uh, diplomacy. Uh, I'd like to make a third uh, preliminary uh, uh, observation before coming to some of the meatier issues of India-Pakistan relations. Uh, and this uh, is about what I referred to earlier is the burden of cynicism, frustration, impatience. Uh, uh, all of this has led to a sense, and this is a sense not just in India, but equally in Pakistan, uh, that uh, in some ways the problems of the present uh, are a visitation of the past. That uh, in the past errors were made, opportunities were missed, because of which we are saddled with a particular set of uh, uh, issues. And there are many examples of this. Uh, uh, and we can discuss it, but, but the examples go back to 1947-1948 itself, to the first war uh, over Kashmir, to the Indus Waters Treaty, to the Simla Agreement signed, I think, in your vice regal uh, lodge, uh, or maybe in the governor's house. Uh, but, but signed in Simla, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, I think, uh, and there are other examples also about 1965, about you know, certain events in the 1980s, in the 1990s. There's this sense that, you know, there was an error of judgment, an opportunity was missed. Uh, otherwise, these problems could have been sorted out once and for all, and we wouldn't have had all these uh, issues which we are currently having to uh, immerse ourselves with. I think the lapse of time, time passed in Simla is, uh, is going to be 50 years, because next year onwards, Bangladesh will be celebrating 50 years of its existence uh, as an independent uh, Nation. The lapse of time also enables a certain oversimplification of issues and a stretching of uh, uh, facts. When one goes into the details of each of these issues, and one can pick up any number of them, a different picture will emerge. Uh, and you will see, uh, and we will find uh, that, uh, in fact, the interpretation which is being drawn uh, is an oversimplification and in many cases totally wrong, totally erroneous. Uh, and uh, it is not as if things are the way they are today because of what happened in the past. Obviously, there is a historical continuity in how we arrived here today. But it is not to say that there was a, there was a great opportunity missed uh, because of which we are uh, where we are uh, today, I think that view emerges out of the sense of cynicism and frustration about how do we address issues with a neighbor like Pakistan, given the suboptimal relationship which has existed for such a long uh, period of uh, time. Uh, with those preliminary remarks, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the substance of India-Pakistan relations. Now, again, one can look at different periods. The, the relationship itself now has a history and a diplomatic history. Uh, I'll look very briefly at the last, uh, at the period we are in and at the last 20, 25 uh, years, just to get a sense of uh, where uh, we are positioned uh, uh, 
uh, today. And again, as I, I think I said in the beginning, uh, there are no easy answers and there's no magic bullet. It is not as if I'm going to lay out a course of action or a policy prescription about what should be done. But really, the idea is to try to understand where we are and what are the possibilities which exist at this point of time. If we look at the last past quarter century, if we go back to uh, roughly the uh, early uh, 90s, mid 90s, uh, in India, we have had uh, in this period, uh, six prime ministers, five different uh, governments, five general elections. And if I were to sum it up, one could say that virtually the entire political spectrum as it exists in the country has either been in government or has supported the then government in the past quarter century. Uh, and you know you can look at all the different combinations and uh, uh, permutations and combinations. In Pakistan, in the same period, there have been 10 prime ministers, five general elections. There's been a long period of military rule between 1999 and 2008. But again, uh, on the whole, as in India, virtually the entire political spectrum as it exists has at some point of time either been in the government or has been supporting the government. Uh, now, the other feature about the last 25 years uh, is that there has been a binary of engagement and disengagement. And there are many examples of this. For instance, we are presently in the midst, deep in the midst of a disengagement uh, phase. A few years ago, we were in the midst of an engagement phase. Before that, there was another disengagement phase. So there's been this uh, binary uh, of engagement versus disengagement. And if one looks at the last 25 years, uh, this binary also has been pretty consistent. Uh, so if you put this binary alongside the fact that the entire political spectrum has been party to this uh, binary, uh, what you come up with is the fact that uh, this engagement, disengagement binary has very deep structural roots, uh, both in India uh, and in, uh, uh, in Pakistan. Let me explain what I, uh, what I mean. It is not as if we have moved from engagement to disengagement because of changes in government. Uh, in the same government, you have seen engagement, disengagement, engagement, disengagement. If you see the first NDA government between 1998 and 2004, uh, they began with engagement, went into disengagement, went into engagement again, went again into disengagement, and finally ended on a high note of uh, uh, engagement following Mr. Vajpayee's visit to uh, Pakistan and Islamabad in 2004. Similarly, the UPA uh, government began with disengagement. Then after the Mumbai suburban uh, train terrorist attacks, there was a period of disengagement. Then engagement again, Mumbai terrorist attack of 2008, again disengagement. And finally, uh, it ended on a phase uh, of neither engagement nor disengagement, a very uneasy kind of uh, relationship. The current government in its first term began on the note of very high engagement. I think people tend to forget or we tend to overlook uh, because of the poor state of relations uh, just now as to how high a note of engagement the current note, uh, government began when uh, the Pakistan Prime Minister was invited uh, to the swearing in uh, of the new, uh, new uh, government. It was op optically possibly one of the most powerful gestures you have seen in India-Pakistan history uh, since uh, 1947, because both prime ministers were very consciously uh, jumping across multiple barriers. Uh, in, in the invitation being extended, in the invitation being accepted, and finally in the, uh, the presence of the Pakistan prime minister during the swearing in ceremony, of the Indian Prime Minister. There are all kinds of issues which were being surmounted by this simple, by the fact of this simple, uh, uh, simple visit. Uh, so my point is that your entire political spectrum has participated in the process of dealing with uh, uh, Pakistan much 
uh, in much the same way in the last 25, uh, in the last 25 years. Uh, I had mentioned that there have been six, uh, uh, six prime ministers uh, in the past 25 years, and it would also be fair to say uh, that each of them has really gone out on a limb uh, in attempting to uh, address, uh, uh, trying to improve relations with uh, Pakistan. You can begin with uh, Prime Minister Gujral, to, uh, uh, to, Dr., to Mr. Vajpayee, to Dr. Manmohan Singh, to Mr. Narendra uh, uh, Modi. In fact, in many ways, Prime Minister Modi has probably tried harder than uh, any of his predecessors. Because you saw in the first two years of his first government, uh, the kind of uh, investment of uh, personal political capital uh, in improving relations with Pakistan, which I don't think has been seen uh, that visibly uh, uh, before. Now, uh, it is a fact that notwithstanding all these efforts, things have uh, not really uh, improved. Uh, and uh, things have not really worked uh, in the way uh, they were uh, expected uh, to work, uh, which itself leads to, uh, you know, its own set of conclusions uh, uh, being drawn. And there are, uh, there are different conclusions which are uh, drawn from this, uh, uh, this uh, enormous failure, uh, which has often uh, accompanied Indian policy uh, initiatives. Uh, one set of conclusions is that you know you keep trying the same thing uh, when uh, when you can and you can expect that the result uh, is going to be the uh, the same. So it is a this is a kind of lunacy that when you repeat the same thing uh, when you know that the result is going to be the same but you still keep on go, doing the same thing. It's a form of uh, lunacy. This is one conclusion uh, which is. Uh, uh, which is uh, drawn. Uh, and uh, the, the general view is that there's no point engaging with Pakistan uh, because you know that uh, uh, a breakdown is inevitable and disengagement will follow. So why make the effort at all? Uh, and uh, a corollary of that is that you're inviting risks by taking initiatives or by embarking upon uh, a particular uh, initiative. Uh, the second is uh, the second conclusion, which is often drawn from this history of failure, uh, is that uh, you know that uh, this is a DNA problem in Pakistan, and I referred to it uh, earlier. It's very similar to the kind of debate which used to take place in uh, the United Kingdom and in uh, in uh, from the uh, around the middle of the nineteenth uh, century, which was uh, Europe's German problem, and especially uh, after. The First World War, there was this view about the Europe's German problem, that there's something fundamental to the German uh, character, uh, which makes uh, uh, which makes for for aggression. And uh, AJP Taylor uh, coined a number of uh, epigrams about this. And one of them is, and this uh, certainly superficially at least applies to Pakistan. Uh, he said, every German frontier is artificial, therefore impermanent. And that is the permanence of German geography. Uh, in other words, that there is a there is a predisposition in Germany, and you cannot do anything uh, uh, about it. There's a similar perception uh, in many circles about Pakistan uh, today. And, and as I said, it had uh, its cartographic anxieties are such that it makes for a certain pattern of uh, aggressive uh, behavior. And Professor Paranjpe referred quite. Uh, very well to that cartographic anxiety when he talked about the Durand line and the the Durand the Durand, uh, uh, the Durand line and the uh, and the Ratcliffe uh, uh, line and in fact if you look at uh, uh, Pakistan uh, Pakistan in a, as a cartographic entity today you see these uh, artificial uh, boundaries uh, throughout uh, you have an artificial separation between Balochistan and Iran and Balochistan and Pakistan through the Iran-Pakistan uh, uh, border. You have an artificial separation between the Pathans in Afghanistan and the, uh, and the Pathans in, uh, uh, in uh, Pakistan through the Durand line. 
Uh, you have a boundary with China, which is entirely ambiguous because of Pakistan's own stand on Jammu and uh, Kashmir. And finally, you have the Radcliffe uh, line. Now, you can you get an insight into Pakistani behavior if you realize that the most stable border which Pakistan has today uh, is, in fact, the Radcliffe line. Because everything else uh, is, a, is a border which is either ambiguous uh, or is prone to conflict. If you look at the situation of the Uran line or the, the situation of Pakistan-Afghanistan relations today, you look at the very fractious relationship with uh, Iran where sectarian and identity issues uh, converge on the divided province of uh, uh, Balochistan. You look at the situation across the LOC with India and Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, so you realize that the most stable border which Pakistan has uh, uh, today is in fact the Radcliffe line, and it's true. Nothing happens on the international border between India and Pakistan. It is a totally stable, controlled, uh, uh, very, very uh, tightly controlled border on both sides. And because of that, it is entirely peaceful. So my brief point is that you can think of Pakistan as this particular set of uh, DNA uh, issues, and therefore any political initiative is going to end up uh, uh, nowhere. And this is precisely the burden of uh, uh, cynicism which Indian diplomacy has to carry all the time while dealing with uh, with while dealing with uh, uh, with uh, Pakistan. So where does that where does that leave you today? This is the point I really wish to uh, wish to come to and. Uh, how do we look at the period? Uh, how do we look at the period uh, ahead? And there, unfortunately, we don't have too many very clear markers. Uh, because one thing which is very clear is that whatever else may change, your neighbors will not change. Uh, and uh, that is one. That is the one stable marker that you have. And the second stable marker which you have is that whatever else may change, your region will not change. And your neighbor, and your region has a huge influence on your neighborhood. If you look at the quality of India-Pakistan relations in the last 30 years, you will realize that there are certain seminal events in your neighborhood which have transformed your bilateral relationship. 1979 was one year. 1979 saw the Islamic Revolution in Iran, the Soviet occupation of uh, Afghanistan, the beginnings of Islamic radicalism in Saudi Arabia because of the takeover of the, takeover of the Grand Mosque, uh, and a decisive setback for uh, the forces of democracy in Pakistan with the execution of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. All these factors happened in 1979 in our immediate uh, region. Alongside, there were other factors, of course, other major changes taking place, which is the establishment of diplomatic relations between China and the United States, uh, the rise of China as an economic uh, uh, power, and so on and so forth. If you come 10 years later to 1989, 1990, again, you see a cluster of changes in our region, which uh, have an immediate impact on your bilateral uh, relationship, which is the Soviet withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan, the coming down of the Berlin Wall, and the redrawing of uh, uh, redrawing of uh, you know, this cartographic redrawing of Europe, the end of the Cold uh, War, and finally the beginnings of the insurgency in Jammu and Kashmir uh, with, the big, with, the, with the eviction of the Kashmiri Pandits from uh, Srinagar, which began and end 1989, January uh, 1990. Now, these are all regional developments which have a great impact on your bilateral uh, relationship. So, in brief, and I could go on about these international and regional developments uh, uh, at some uh, length, but the point is that if you look at the future ahead, the stable markers you have are that your neighborhood is going to remain the same, uh, and secondly, the, your regional environment uh, is going to have a great impact on your uh, neighborhood. So, today, when you look at uh, a post COVID uh, hopefully a post-COVID world, because I'm sure at some stage uh, this virus epidemic will come to an end, but it will have a devastating impact on our 
uh, economies and on the global uh, economy. You have the rise of a global, a second global hegemon in the form of uh, China, uh, and you have a consolidation of uh, Pakistan-China uh, concert uh, in many uh, ways. Uh, uh, these factors are going to have an impact on your bilateral uh, relationship, and therefore you have to think about how you are going to deal with your neighbor uh, in the period ahead. Does your do you have any ready-made uh, template for dealing with your neighbor? No, uh, because uh, as I said, neighboring country relationships are uh, difficult uh, and they have to be therefore viewed both in tactical terms or what the military calls kinetic terms, but also in larger strategic and foreign policy terms. What we have been in the last two or three years is I think a kinetic phase of our uh, relationship which is uh, uh, the action which we had to take post Pulwawa uh, or the action we had to take post uh, Uri. These are kinetic uh, responses. They are tactical uh, responses because of an emergent terrorist uh, threat. These are things which have to be done. This is part of dealing with difficult uh, neighbors. But does this constitute the whole of a policy? It obviously does not because you need a larger, uh, you need a larger vision uh, for how you are going to deal with your neighbors. And if we look at our own history, you will find elements of that larger, uh, larger vision. In the, in the midst of a very poor state of India-Pakistan relations, uh, possibly one of the worst states in the last 50, 60 years, you had a breakthrough uh, which nobody expected, nobody had planned for in the form of the Kartarpur Saab uh, visa-free uh, corridor. Now, implementing a step like that, even at the best of times, would have been difficult. The fact that you can do it at the worst of times tells you something about a tactical vision and a strategic vision. Uh, and I think a foreign policy has to be made up of both these, uh, uh, of both these uh, dimensions. We cannot just deal with Pakistan uh, uh, in, uh, as an as a issue to be resolved on the LOC or on the border. Uh, it requires a larger view of uh, India, uh, not just as a country, but also as a civilization. Uh, because it's only as a civilization that you realize that you have intrinsic strengths, which uh, your nationhood, nationhood by itself doesn't uh, reveal to you. Uh, those strengths only come when you look deep into your history and reach into your civilization uh, for those intrinsic uh, strengths. So I think when we are talking about uh, addressing issues with Pakistan, we have to uh, combine both these. And I think I have four minutes left, uh, Dr. Paranjpur. So I'll try to I'll try to close off in four minutes, and then we can have a discussion in the next. No, uh, you, you, you no, you are perfectly free to resume after the little break for your winding up remarks. No okay. problem at all. Okay. okay. So, uh, so we have to combine uh, both. Uh, strategic as well as a kinetic uh, uh, vision when we deal with uh, our uh, neighbors. And this really brings me to my last point, uh, which was that is it part of our larger foreign policy? Is it part, isn't it part of our larger strategic approach that we deal with neighbors, not just in terms of a security paradigm, but also in terms of a, a desecuritization approach? Now, it would be fanciful to think that you can address issues with Pakistan only on the basis of desecuritization. Obviously, you can't because there are serious uh, security issues, military issues, which are embedded in that interface with Pakistan. But we have to think about how do we enlarge the, the desecuritized element uh, in your uh, relationship. And this is something which you can't do, uh, you know, in the short term, it is something which you have to address uh, in the, without being uh, fanciful or uh, without uh, you know, suspending reality. Uh, I think realism requires that uh, security and geopolitical and uh, military uh, aspects are inbuilt into your relationship. My point simply is that we also have to think of the other large chunk, uh, which is the the non-security or desecuritized uh, 
elements and there's no better time for doing so uh, than today because we are all in the midst of this black swan event for which even the most advanced economies and the most advanced economic military powers mm -hmm. uh, had no real defenses uh, against as in World ahead, we can't predict with certainty what all will change because of uh, uh, this pandemic. Uh, in many ways, traditional geopolitics as we know it will continue because you have uh, a new uh, hegemonic uh, contest which is going to unfold in the years uh, uh, to come and how you position yourself in that hegemonic contest uh, will be a real test for your foreign uh, policy. But having said all that, what is also clear is that on uh, non-traditional security issues, uh, which otherwise command a smaller part of the geopolitical spectrum, their space will grow. Uh, just yesterday, we had the Reserve Bank of India talking about uh, the dangers of climate change. Uh, and the, the, the grave threat which climate change poses to fiscal stability. When a central bank governor talks language like that, then it means that, yes, uh, you have to think much more seriously about uh, climate change and environment issues uh, than you were uh, doing. So what you can, you can predict is that non-traditional security issues will, uh, will they're spread in our interface with Pakistan may increase a little bit. How much it will increase, we don't know. But certainly, our effort should be to try to increase it to the extent uh, possible without, as I said, um, being fanciful uh, about it. And there are many uh, uh, examples of how this possibly may already be happening. A SARC, which was moribund, uh, suddenly got a wake-up call and suddenly seemed to there was a flurry of activity uh, because of a health minister's meet and because our prime minister took the initiative to call for a SARC meet on how to deal with the uh, pandemic. And there are other uh, examples of this. Now, when we put non-traditional security uh, in an India-Pakistan context, you find that there have been three major attempts to desecuritize the India-Pakistan relationship. Uh, now, out of these three attempts, two have been failures, as it looks right now. And one has been a part success or maybe a reasonable uh, success. Uh, the success was in the case of the Indus Waters. A major effort to find a non-security related, non-security answer uh, to a very contentious issue how do you share between upper and lower riparian states? And the answer you came up was in the form of the Indus Waters regime. It's a very good example of uh, you know how you have exp how you expanded at that time the non-security uh, part of the spectrum, how you desecuritized uh, an aspect of the relationship, and that has been a reasonable uh, success. The two failures have been, uh, firstly, in the area of trade, where at one, which at one stage everyone thought was the kind of uh, was, the, was the was the magic bullet to dissolve old enmities. Uh, I think the trade initiative uh, failed, or has failed so far. Uh, and another very very interesting idea which failed was the idea of uh, energy security. Uh, to uh, Iran, Pakistan, India gas pipeline, and there are multiple reasons for that uh, for that uh, failure. But my point was that you have these three major examples of uh, non uh, of desecuritizing India-Pakistan relations, and out of which uh, two have uh, failed, and one was a reasonably okay success uh, so far. Not a hundred percent success, but reasonable, better than others. Uh, are there areas of non-traditional security where India and Pakistan should now start thinking about? I think so, but they are not easy because many of these uh, many of these traditional 
non security areas are very contentious in the india pakistan uh, context so so issues such as uh, addressing climate change is difficult you know, because climate change in in the in in south asia is related to issues such as glacial melt anything to do with glaciers is geopolitical uh, as far as india and pakistan are concerned similarly environmental pollution uh, ground water uh, levels all of these are uh, ipso facto contentious uh, uh, issues uh, there are some non contentious issues on one of which uh, there's been a surprising amount of cooperation uh, between india and pakistan uh, notwithstanding the poor relationship politically which there has been and that is in the area of cooperation on locusts uh, it's very interesting that uh, in the past 30 40 years despite uh, periods of very high tension conflicts between india and pakistan one small niche area where india co pakistan cooperation has gone on uninterrupted uh, is uh, locust prevention and every year between uh, september october november which is the locust breeding season in sind Uh, south punjab and rajasthan gujarat you have uh, scientists and locust officials meeting at the border uh, regularly this is one small niche uh, area which has somehow managed to insulate itself from the larger dynamics of uh, india pakistan uh, geopolitics my sense is that one take away from this pandemic is that public health uh, which has otherwise very little conflict with the traditional uh, Uh, areas of geopolitics could possibly emerge uh, as an area of cooperation between uh, india and uh, pakistan as indeed in south asia uh, as a uh, as a whole how this will happen whether this is possible in the short term or in the medium term these are unresolved issues but i think and i want to close here i think uh, uh, my point is that uh, uh, we cannot think about ourselves uh, we cannot think about india and the world without first thinking about india and our neighbors i think the prime minister is quite right in saying that neighborhood neighbors first and uh, neighborhood uh, first in the end whatever people may say to you in fact they will judge you by how you manage your neighborhood uh, this is the this is the unfortunate responsibility which is posed Uh, to a to a great power uh, in a region so uh, so this is the thought i wish to leave with you that uh, as we look ahead in india pakistan relations while the past is a guide uh, i don't think we should be bound by it and certainly this idea that you can deal with pakistan at a tactical or kinetic level or deal with it as a security uh, issue alone is not something which uh, you will be able to uh, have make it in conformity to with the rest of your uh, external policy and foreign uh, policy so thank you very much again professor uh, paranjpe for inviting me to share my thoughts uh, with you today thank you thank you thank you mr raghavan we already have questions coming to us on chat i just wanted to possibly raise one or two issues uh, i think you've uh, uh, you know i think you've very persuasively He steered us between the extremes of the hawks and the doves in a very realistic manner and uh, tried to show how we can't be fixated only on a security oriented uh, framework when we think about our neighborhood especially pakistan uh, i was uh, one why you i think didn't uh, emphasize uh, or uh, elaborate on the potential of leadership in other words i uh, mentioned how many prime ministers on both sides have tried to uh, uh, you know speak with leadership and our prime minister I remember he made a surprise stop uh, and went and visited nawaz sharif on his way back which was uh, which was quite dramatic and he was very well received what i'm really asking is can leaders make a difference and uh, obviously i mean there was great hope with uh, vajpayee's bus diplomacy also nothing much came out of it 
And when Imran Khan, who was very popular in India as a cricketer, became the, uh, you know, the, uh, the prime minister of Pakistan, again, there was some hope. But on the other hand, people said he's just a puppet of the military. In other words, uh, can leadership make a difference on both sides? Or is it that only Indian leaders can make a bit of a difference? Whereas in Pakistan, regardless of who the leader is, the actual uh, deep state that controls the country is the military. So that was my first question to you. And the second was, is a little more contentious, and it has to deal with, uh, you know, the bigger issues of, uh, uh, you know, our relationship, uh, which are also in your book. And at the heart of it is this uh, question of Hindu-Muslim relations, you know, for which, in a sense, even Gandhi gave his life. And we, we now see in Pakistan, it would seem, uh, the final phase of an ethnic cleansing with forcible abductions and marriages and conversions of uh, Hindu girls, with the result that probably the population of Hindus in Pakistan, which is uh, you know around 2%, may, or 3%, I don't know the exact figures, may uh, actually become close to zero. On the other hand, in India, we, we have seen a shift towards a kind of majoritarian uh, government with uh, an official ideology, Hindutva. And uh, that has also resulted in the change of Jammu and Kashmir from being a state to two union territories. So these were my two questions, my preliminary questions, and then I will take up the questions that I've received from the fellows. Go ahead, sir. Well, I agree with you about uh, uh, leadership. If you see uh, uh, India-Pakistan relations, uh, you cannot underestimate the role of political initiative. Uh, and most of the time, uh, the initiatives have uh, come uh, largely uh, as a result of the political judgment of the Prime Minister. Not so much... Uh, uh, the, the professional advice uh, given to him uh, or to her. There are many examples of this. Nobody expected Prime Minister Vajpayee in 2003 uh, to reach out with a hand of friendship to Pakistan. This, is, you know, this was in the period of uh, uh, the, uh, after the attack on our Parliament, mobilization of the army, Operation Parakaram, that had gone on for about a year, year and a half. Nobody expected. In fact, uh, the advice at that time was that don't uh, take political initiatives. But uh, Prime Minister Bajpayee, acting on largely his own political judgment, decided to go ahead. You are quite right to referring to the visit of our Prime Minister to Lahore. Uh, as I said, it was a major political uh, initiative uh, and an optical uh, uh, with with a certain optical impact, uh, which was it was a, it, uh, it was it was the kind of uh, uh, gesture which makes which gives real substance to a political uh, initiative. Now again, it was largely, uh, into my mind, his own political judgment. Although the ground for it had been prepared, you had had the visit of the external affairs minister to Islamabad just two, three weeks earlier. The national security advisors had met just two weeks before uh, his visit. The ground had been prepared. But I think that uh, initiative itself was uh, a question of uh, leadership uh, uh, judgment. And there are many other examples. So I think uh, one should not exclude the role of political initiative. And one can, in fact, quite uh, reasonably predict uh, that the present jam in India-Pakistan relations uh, will not be broken by uh, you know, the normal diplomatic uh, efforts, but will be the outcome of political uh, initiatives. Should, uh, would, uh, would they come from India? Most certainly, yes. And why is that? I think the political space available to the Prime Minister of India uh, is far in excess to what is available to uh, Pakistan, any leader in Pakistan. I mean, those are the realities of the situation. The second reality is that the burden on expect of expectation on you uh, internationally uh, is much more than the burden of expectation from Pakistan. 
that is the second reason which has always uh, meant uh, why India has had to take the uh, initiatives. The problem is that, uh, as I said, because of this uh, inbuilt in cynicism which we have, there is a great deal of domestic uh, resistance and inertia. Uh, and this is precisely where the, pol uh, the role of political leadership comes in, is of overcoming that inertia and that uh, resistance. The second one was the question about uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Hindu-Muslim uh, uh, relations. You see, you can you can uh, extract uh, India-Pakistan relations from extract from India-Pakistan relations. Uh, you know, a number of factors which appear to be uh, drivers. Uh, the first is this issue of uh, identity. Uh, is that a uh, driver in India-Pakistan uh, relations. I think it is a driver to some extent uh, in Pakistan, to a lesser extent than in uh, in India. Why is it such a driver in Pakistan? Because uh, I think the answer lies not so much in the Hindu-Muslim polarity uh, as in the burden uh, which a successor state carries. You see, one tends to overlook uh, the fact that Pakistan is a successor state. Uh, Pakistan is the breakaway state. It's not the successor state. So there's a burden on the breakaway state which the successor state does not uh, uh, carry. Uh, and when you live in Islamabad or you, when you live in Pakistan, what you realize uh, is that if you look at uh, India-Pakistan relations through a narrow prism of the geopolitical issues involved, you tend to forget how much of a hegemonic role India has in Pakistan. Uh, in, uh, and, and in social terms, in cultural terms, and in intellectual uh, terms, uh, you know, you have uh, a very, very, uh, maybe hegemonic is the wrong word to use, but it is the closest that I can uh, think of but you are in many ways a kind of cultural hegemon in uh, in Pakistan. So, so I won't see it in terms of uh, Hindu-Muslim uh, issues. I would see it in terms of the complexes which a breakaway state has uh, towards a hegemonic power in its neighborhood. Uh, I think th I think that is certainly a driver in India-Pakistan uh, relations. Maybe the identity issues, maybe the Hindu-Muslim issues. Play a role, but I think that role has been coming down regularly over the uh, over the years. I think that is a role, that is a factor which we in India, because of our own domestic disputes and domestic contestations and domestic debates, we try to transplant onto the India-Pakistan interface. But I don't think it actually exists in the way people imagine it to. The second is the issue of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. You're quite right. I think Jammu and Kashmir uh, is a major factor. There's no denying it. K in Pakistan, after all, stands for Kashmir. And uh, most Pakistanis feel that Kashmir is uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the final part of the partition of the division of the subcontinent, and it is yet to be completed. Uh, so, uh, yes, I think it is a major factor. You can't uh, escape from that. But, but that is a factor which has been there for a long time. And uh, the question is, how do you deal with that uh, issue? I think in Article 370, the internal legislative changes made last year, those are, uh, those are, not, uh, those are not fundamental. Pakistan, after all, never gave any importance to Article 370 uh, till it was finally uh, done away with or hollowed out. Uh, Pakistan never recognized uh, the independent uh, state of Jammu and Kashmir or uh, 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 it never recognized the status of the state of Jammu and Kashmir in India. So the fact that it is giving importance to that it over from a state, it's become a union territory and their autonomy has been taken away. These were factors it never gave any importance to. In the past, Pakistan was quite happy dealing with numerous chief ministers of India. Uh, the one chief minister they would never break any bread with was the chief minister of Jammu and Kashmir. 
So why is there this sudden? Uh, so I don't think that is a fundamental factor. Yes, Jammu and Kashmir is a factor. What happened last year is only symptomatic. Uh, if you decide to move forward or you find a framework to move forward, I don't think what has happened last year is going to go in the way. Uh, but you have to find that larger framework which makes it possible for both to move forward. Okay, now we'll take some questions which have come uh, from our fellows. The first question has come from Professor Chahel, and he's playing on uh, your use of the genetic factor. And he asks, when people from both sides have the same genes, why should the genetic factor be so important? Well, in my view, the, there's no genetic factor. Uh, uh, some people say that there is a DNA issue that you can't expect anything different uh, from India-Pakistan relations because of the way uh, genes uh, are, uh, are uh, uh, configured. But I don't believe in that. I don't think there is any genetic factor. I think these are political issues uh, which have to be resolved, uh, which have to be addressed, which have to be minimized through uh, diplomacy uh, and through political initiatives. I don't think there is any genetic predisposition either in India or in Pakistan, which condemns both to have such a poor relationship. Can I come in? I think that uh, there are two, three points that you very seriously missed out. The first one. Sorry, the best question. you there, sir. Can you just repeat? We heard uh, the point that uh, so there's no genetic factor. I think, can you just recap from there, if you don't mind? We lost you for a uh, minute. Oh, you didn't hear me. No, we completely lost you when you said, you're right, there's no genetic factor. After that, we missed. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I, I, I said that uh, I, I, uh, in my view, there is no genetic factor which predisposes India and Pakistan to have such a poor uh, relationship. You have political issues, you have diplomatic issues, you have a host of uh, uh, unresolved uh, uh, differences, but there's nothing... Uh, th these are part of the uh, part of most of many neighboring country uh, relationships. There's nothing specifically uh, unique to India and Pakistan uh, about this. So, in brief, I don't think there's any. I, I I said there are people who believe that there is a predisposition in India and Pakistan which makes for a bad relationship. I don't agree with that. Exactly. In other words, just as Germany and uh... You know, Britain were the worst of enemies, and now they're good friends. We can also have good neighborly relations sometime in the foreseeable future. Anyhow, that brings me to the second question, which is exactly about this neighborly relations from Professor Rajvi Sharma. And he says that if you have an Asuri, have an Asuri neighbor in Pakistan, then how do you build good relations? So your talk did uh, touch a number of issues from terrorism to environmental and human security, riparian issues, the water issues. So of course, we have so many reasons to mend our fences, as it were. But when you have, as he puts it, an Asuri neighbor, then then uh, isn't there a structural problem in, uh, in, in uh, improving our relationship? That's the question. No, clearly there are structural uh, problems, and clearly uh, in the period since uh, 1989, there has been an extent of Pakistan provocation, uh, which uh, would seriously destabilize any relationship. Uh, my point is, having said that, uh, uh, is there scope for moving uh, forward? Uh, I would say yes, uh, and one can go into the details uh, uh, of it. Uh, but more than anything else, uh, 
you have no other option uh, than going uh, forward because the question is not the question is not uh, uh, whether you are doing so for the sake of good neighborly relations or for the sake of uh, some kind of a mythical uh, uh, cultural commonality or civilizational commonality that you share that's not the question the question is whether it's in your interest or not uh, i mean from a geopolitical point of view it is entirely in your interest that your neighborhood again, is stable yeah again we missed about 30 seconds you said the question is not and then we we lost you for 30 seconds the question is not the question the question is not uh, uh, whether you uh, are doing this for the sake of uh, uh, good neighborly uh, relations or because you believe that there is some cultural commonality uh, which enables uh, which means that there is a reservoir of goodwill which you can tap no those are not the issue uh, you are you are trying to optimize your relationship because it is in your interest it's in your national interest to do so it's not in your national interest that you have a uh, highly securitized unstable relationship with the immediate neighbor it's not good for your economy it's not good for your overall uh, profile and plus it's a dangerous situation uh, that you have a uh, you know an adversarial hist historically adversarial relationship with a nuclear power which is internally unstable that you should leave it like that and and proceed on the basis that there is no option but for this relationship to be bad it's not in your interests uh, so you have to act as per your interests exactly not now i mean uh, the professor sharma has a follow up question asks doesn't that require a tactical shift in our planning where democracy is only a pretense in pakistan why shouldn't we pursue the tactical policy of dismembering pakistan think your policy has anything to do with uh, democracy in pakistan uh, or not you know whether you like it or not pakistan is a country of 200 million people uh, it is the fifth or sixth largest country in the world uh, by and large it grows enough to feed itself it has nuclear weapons it's not going to go away anywhere you have no policy toolkit easily available that you can change the nature or structure of it he's saying he's saying can you not dismember it further like you, bangladesh and pakistan now baluchistan sindh and so forth that's the implication of I the think question this is i think you have no you have no immediate policy options to do that as i said this is 200 million people with nuclear weapons uh, it has a neighborhood uh, which uh, with which uh, it has reasonably all right relations it is not in any other it is not in anyone's conceivable interest uh, to assist you if you had a policy of breaking up pakistan uh, so i think a lot of this is fanciful uh, thinking which we let uh, and we sometimes uh, you know we have to deal with the world as it is not the world as we would like it to be so it uh, so these are options which when you go into the details of it are actually non option you know i i would just add a footnote even a powerful country like the united states you know could not take down syria because syria was not libya so mm -hmm. similarly i mean uh, from what i gather and what i have read the pakistani state is not so unstable that you can just you know rip it apart that easily and let's just take another question this is dr subramanian he says what is the potential of tourism pilgrimage in opening up non security niches also people to be to come back now i must say that in your book you talked about this whole amki asha initiative and how it came out of copper so the question can be further refined to ask how the pilgrimage and kartarpur corridor can change that earlier people to people track to uh, which ultimately you know didn't succeed as well as people had hoped 
You see, uh, uh, I think uh, people to people uh, contacts and tourism and pilgrimages are important in themselves. But we shouldn't expect these initiatives to move mountains. Uh, more pilgrimages in both directions will not mean that your political relationship will improve. It is helpful, yes, but it's. I don't think one can put so much of a, um, you know, you can't expect uh, uh, people to people initiatives to transform uh, deeply adversarial relations. To do that, you have to address the political issues uh, involved. But, uh, you know, one should also uh, recognize how the impact of these people to people and tourism and pilgrimages, how the impact of that is, in fact, very region specific in India. Uh, views about Pakistan and Punjab are quite different from views about Pakistan in Tamil Nadu. Views about Pakistan and Rajasthan are quite different from views in uh, Karnataka. Those states which are closer uh, in physical terms uh, to Pakistan have a different perspective uh, because naturally they are in the front line uh, of the downside of the impact of the downside when relations are not good. Uh, if you uh, in Pakistan for in Punjab for instance. There is a pretty big community, there's a pretty big uh, constituency in support of improvement of relations, which you will not find uh, elsewhere in the country, because in Punjab in particular, a lot of tourism, a lot of services, a lot of trade, uh, in fact, stands to benefit if relations eased between India uh, and Pakistan. And a lot of the push, for instance, from the Kartarpur, for the Kartarpur corridor came from uh, there. So I don't think one should underestimate the impact of this uh, at the regional or sub-regional uh, level. But I think uh, at the national level, when one is talking about overall policy, these uh, things like tourism pilgrimage have some limited role, but we should be on the guard against giving it too much importance. I don't think Aman, to, Aman Ki Asha will transform India-Pakistan uh, relations. You need political initiatives to do. Well, uh, Dr. Subramaniam has a follow-up question. He's saying that, do you think that uh, uh, making efforts to accept the legitimacy of fact of Pakistan will help? Which implies that a lot of people in India do not accept the legitimacy or the fact of Pakistan, I suppose. No, I think in India, I don't think there's any issue of that. I, I don't think there is a view that uh, we don't accept the existence of uh, Pakistan. There is this, uh, there used to be rather this view in Pakistan that India is not reconciled uh, to the to the okay. division of the subcontinent and this Akhand Bharat view uh, still holds uh, a lot of uh, weight. But I don't think, uh, I mean, living in India, I don't get that impression. I don't think, I think, People are quite happy with the borders that they are. Uh, there may be a few in the fringe who feel that all this can be changed. But I think the mainstream view is that we have to live with the borders that we have. In fact, uh, some people, uh, even, you know, in the Hindutva circles, if one might say so, actually feel that uh, the partition was a blessing in disguise because there's a theory that uh, uh, the demographic, uh, should I say, threat would have been much greater at 30 percent instead of 12 percent to deal with, like Lebanon. But we leave that aside. Uh, here's another question. Uh, the, what is your opinion? This is from Dr. Anjali Duhan. What is your opinion on the restricted people-to-people -people contact? which creates ambiguities between the masses. When people from both nationalities meet in any of the Western countries, they often become the best of friends. Well, it is true that uh, if you leave politics uh, out of it, uh, Indians and Pakistanis uh, are the best of uh, friends and therefore in neutral platforms, 
Uh, you hear this constantly from students that my best friend is a Pakistani. Uh, when I was high commissioner in Pakistan, I used to be deluged with requests for visas uh, from uh, young Pakistani men and women who wanted to travel to India to attend a college friend's uh, wedding or engagement. Yes, there is that cultural uh, uh, commonality. Uh, and I think uh, it is important for its own sake. It is important in itself. Uh, and certainly we should do what we can uh, to foster it. The current situation is quite exceptional in India-Pakistan relations that there's almost no people-to-people uh, -people contact uh, right now. Uh, and I think we should try to remedy that as soon as we can. Uh, so it is important in itself. My point simply is that I don't think we can ex we should expect this cultural commonality uh, to lead to political change. I think we have to, uh, given the background of the past 70 years, we should be prepared to admit that there are deeply held Pakistani positions on many issues, just like there are equally strong Indian positions on those issues. And both positions are far apart. It requires, it's a very difficult job to try to bridge this gap. But we need to recognize that there is an actual uh, problem and that uh, there are these differences in positions on a whole range of uh, issues. So we can't just paper over it by stretching, stressing on the fact that we enjoy the same literature, listen to the same music, go to the same films, uh, and so on. Uh, because uh, uh, I mean, I, I use, I attend a lot of these India-Pakistan uh, discussions and interactions, and you find those discussions are wonderful and really heartwarming. But there is a kind of a unspoken. Uh, tacit agreement on both sides that you won't go into controversial issues. Uh, I think discussions become meaningful only when you go into controversial uh, issues. I think that's a brilliantly put point. Discussions become meaningful only when you go into controversial points. I suppose, you know, it, it applies not only to neighbors, but also families, even husband and wife. But we have one last question. I just wanted to say that Anjali ji is, uh, I think, very idealistic. I've lived abroad several years. Uh, and I find that the partition of India has actually been replicated in a, in a strange way in communities abroad as well. So it's only a small group which is somewhat enlightened, more secular, but, uh, where the bonhomie is easy and uh and uh, friendships deep otherwise it just as you rightly said even in a cricket match you know a friendly cricket match becomes so contentious people never agree on kashmir they never agree on very religious issues etc etc it's not as simple in fact bangladesh is easier than with pakistan that's been my experience abroad but anyhow the last question is to uh, Professor C.K. Raju, and as usual, he will uh, voice it in his own way, not through a message. He hasn't sent us a message. So go ahead, Professor Raju, unmute your mic, and I'm muted. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, as I was saying, I think there are a lot of other mics which are on. As I was saying, I think you did not touch upon some very critical issues. And uh, let us see, why did the Gujral initiative fail? Why did the Vajpayee initiative fail? See, it was based on a sort of nostalgia. These people were from Lahore. Lahore was a big center, and they had this nostalgia. Yes, we can get together and so on. All you have to do is extend a hand of friendship. But I think that the critical issue, one of the critical issues is the economic failure, complete economic failure of Pakistan. You travel anywhere abroad, you see so many people coming from Pakistan. And they come, you ask them, why are you coming here? Why are you living this kind of a wretched life? There is nothing to do back home. There is no electricity, no water, no factories, nothing. So there's a total failure of the economy. Now, the other thing is that this failure of the economy made the army so large. And, but that has changed. 
But the army was a very critical component of uh, Pakistan once upon a time. But now there is a very strong religious component. And the second thing is that once upon a time, it was always the, um, you know, the Western Maibab who was uh, playing the game between both the people. And now there is a completely different uh, entry from the side of China. So I think that we have to look at these structural changes that today Imran Khan is very shaky, very shaky because it's not just the army alone, but there is also a very strong religious background, their religious leadership that has changed. And the second thing that has changed is that it is no longer Uncle Sam who is sitting on top, but it is China who is sitting there, which is going to make any negotiation almost impossible. Because the kind of thing that has been done, the kind of uh, corridor that has been established in order to get oil and so on. So I think that those are issues, those are structural issues which are changing. And apart from Kashmir and so on, those are the issues, not the nostalgia, not the kind of uh, political initiative that Gujral and Vajpayee visualized, which is going to make a change. I think we have to contend with them. And you said nothing about it. How do you propose to contend with them? Well, firstly, I disagree with uh, the view that uh, Vajpayee or Gujral or Manmohan Singh uh, acted out of nostalgia. Vajpayee, of course, was not from uh, uh, Lahore or Punjab, but Gujral and uh, Manmohan Singh certainly were. And in their, uh, from the way they spoke uh, and often what they wrote, it did appear that what was driving them was. Uh, some kind of nostalgia for the past when they were both in government college Lahore and they love walking through the mall. But in fact, uh, I don't think that is the case. I think they were as hard-headed as any person who becomes Prime Minister of India is. You know, you don't become Prime Minister of India just like anything. So, uh, so, as I, so I don't think uh, their policy was nostalgic. Uh, just like I don't think... Uh, that Prime Minister Modi's policy is uh, uh, only geared towards uh, optical uh, positions. No, it is driven by an understanding of what is your national interest. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, it's not nostalgia. It is a question of, I mean, a lot of what Vajpayee did was, was informed by the fact uh, that India was now a nuclear power and Pakistan had also become a nuclear power. I think that was the fundamental uh, challenge he was trying to address, that the situation in South Asia had changed. It had become a neutralized uh, region. Uh, and uh, you could not deal with Pakistan in the old way. You had to find a new place. Uh, I think that was, uh, that was the main attempt behind his Lahore bus visit. I don't think one should mix up the optics with the substance. The optics are there to make sure that, uh, the, that, that, uh, that the public narrative is, is supportive of your uh, substantive uh, move. But optics are not an end in, it, uh, end in uh, themselves. Uh, so I think a lot of what uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee did was because of May 1998, that you had become a nuclear uh, weapon uh, state. Pakistan was a nuclear weapon state. You had to find a new framework. Uh, and it was quite a hard-headed, uh, I think a lot of what Gujral uh, did uh, or what Gujral embarked upon was in the context of what was happening in the early and mid-1990s. I think we have forgotten what the mid-1990s and the early 1990s were uh, for India. You were suddenly faced with a world which was unipolar. The Soviet Union had collapsed in 1992. There was a major insurgency underway in Kashmir. There was a huge amount of pressure coming to you, uh, coming on you from the United States. Uh, it was not China at that time. You know, China was still inward looking because of Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square, uh, and so on. The pressure at that time was from the United uh, States. Uh, I think that was the context he was uh, really trying to uh, respond to. And it was not just him, also Prime Minister Narasimha Rao. Uh, you know, it was a, so we can't, uh, you know, pretend that they were dealing with the situation uh, where you have certain strengths today which were not available to them then. They, 
I think they had a particular set of issues which they had to resolve, and they were trying to uh, resolve them uh, in the country's interest uh, in a pretty hard-headed way. I don't think it was nostalgia. Uh, or if there was nostalgia, it was a very small element uh, in the total policy input. The second point uh, about uh, China. Yes, it is true, and I think I mentioned it, that there is a China-Pakistan concert. But we have to deal with this, we cannot just term it as something malignant. Uh, it is natural that there will be a China-Pakistan concert. Pakistan is a smaller neighbor next to you, with which you have a history of adversarial relations. They will try to balance you by bringing in bigger powers. They tried it for 40 years with the United States. The United States role in South Asia was always at Pakistan's behest to balance it. Uh, and then following the deterioration in Pakistan-US relations, they are doing it with China. So there's no point our, you know, saying that this is something malignant. It is something which you have to deal with. This is what diplomacy and geopolitics is all uh, about. Uh, and dealing with it means that you rely on diplomacy as the first means of defense. Yes, you have problems with China, you have problems with uh, with Pakistan, but every problem doesn't mean that you, uh, you know, uh, uh, see only security-related uh, solutions. I think for a country like India, the first line of defense has to be diplomacy. Uh, and the more you rely on diplomatic and political means, the better it is in your national interest. Well, you didn't answer my third point, that there is a shift in Pakistan, within Pakistan, from the military, to religious concerns, to a religious but, leadership, but to a actually, dogmatic leadership. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't answer that. I don't agree with that. Uh, I think uh, there is a particular space which conservative and religious elements in Pakistan have always had. Uh, but I don't, I'm not sure whether that space has increased very dramatically. I think analysts in India tend to make too much about that space. Because if you see uh, in, uh, in the last 25 years, for instance, it's not as if the religious parties uh, have done any better uh, in, the, uh, in the elections which have uh, taken place. By and large, their share of the total voting uh, has been roughly about the same 4-5%, never more than that. I think religious parties have a certain, uh, they have certain potential for mobilizing supporters on single issues and bringing about, bringing and having a certain street power. But I don't think that street power has increased. Well, it's also one of those, it's one of those myths which we repeat to ourselves often enough and then start believing uh, uh, ourselves. Uh, I don't know, for a long time there was this view about Zia's generals grabbing hold of nuclear weapons. Uh, Actually, the Pakistani army, the Pakistani military uh, is even more worried about Zia's uh, offshoots than anyone else is. Uh, and they will make sure that they never get into positions of uh, authority. And when they do, they are weeded out quite quickly. I think it's impossible. Uh, sir, we can't hear you. We, we are not able to hear you. Your mic is muted. Okay, now. Yeah. I think we tend to exaggerate the role of the religious uh, elements. They have a certain uh, uh, influence, but I don't think it uh, uh, it uh, it has the kind of role which we often imagine it to have. Most of the time, the religious parties in Pakistan have not acted as an autonomous force. They have once or twice, but most of the time, they have never acted as an autonomous force. They have really been instruments of the Pakistan military. Uh, so the real, the real power is in, held in some other place, not in the religious uh, uh, parties. And it is not as if the religious parties have uh, expanded to such an extent that they, uh, they are now calling the shots. No. I think they have always had a certain influence, uh, amount of influence which has enabled them to be useful instruments sometimes of the military, sometimes of the mainstream political uh, parties, but they have not been a kind of force which we often hear 
it's not as if uh, you know even the, uh, it's not as if the jihadis are deciding policy uh, in uh, pakistan no the problem with pakistan is that jihadis are being used as instruments of state policy not that they are deciding policy thank you one last question had come in from dr adil salam and uh, i've lost it because it was in the earlier chat but i still remember it he says israel and the uae and other arab states are normalizing relationships so is that possible for india a possibility to end pakistan from this process of uh, normalizing well i don't i don't think um, you know india and pakistan will ever become fully normal neighbors and you will always have uh, you know it will always be a bit like japan and china or japan and south korea uh, you will never be uh, it will never be a situation where you will have a uh, totally uh, zero friction problem free relationship to be quite uh, realistic so i don't think we should talk about uh, normalization at the present stage you are so far from normal that it is unrealistic to talk about normalization i think what you have to talk about is stabilization uh, the issue is how do you stabilize your uh, relationship so that it's not uh, uh, it's not poised at these dangerous levels that uh, any uh, untoward development can set you off on a course you don't want to go down sir can can i come in uh who's this this is adil sir okay last last word adil ji we've taken up a lot of time of uh, dr raghavan already so han ji yes, yeah sure yes yes go ahead go ahead i was talking about this uh, israel relations neighbor countries like egypt and jordan so some people are not to the front of israel despite that they have come to an agreement on some minimum issues and they have maintained their relations since nineties so do you have any lesson that we can learn from israel no i think we can we can uh, we can have we have a lot of lessons to learn because as i said uh, uh, for many years uh, for many decades it's not as if efforts were not made but the efforts did not succeed now uh, why they didn't succeed uh, you know leads you down a path of analysis uh, but certainly i mean i think there are many examples i mean for instance uh, you can look at israel and egypt yes that's a good uh, but there are other examples also professor paranjpe had referred to uh, the situation in europe uh, but you have even very good examples closer uh, on your east if you look at asean Malaysia and Indonesia had a long history of very very poor relations, uh, but they still managed to uh, agree on uh, certain fundamentals. Uh, and one fundamental they agreed on was that we will not let uh, territorial and other disputes come in the way of economic development of our people. Now, which was uh, uh, which was a pretty good uh, understanding as far as those two countries were concerned. now why india and pakistan have not been able to reach that kind of understanding despite numerous efforts uh, as i said every prime minister in india has tried very hard for just that kind of understanding uh, and it has not uh, been successful now one can uh, there is a reason, there is a scope for ana analyzing that and a lot of analysis uh, has been done but in my view uh, you know you can go on discussing the reasons but uh, analysis uh, general musharraf used to say too much analysis leads to paralysis paralysis so, so i don't think what should uh, i think uh, the point is that you uh, in your own national interests you have to persist with these efforts it's not for the greater good of humanity or because of any intrinsic uh, desire to improve uh, uh, for 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 the people for improve relations with the people of pakistan no none of that it is just in your national interest that you have more stable relations 
and you can reach certain minimum understanding. I think that's very well put. I was just thinking that uh, coming back to the present, one of the policy changes that we detect is a slightly more uh, hardline approach where, you know, there are issues not just of terrorism, but drugs, fake currency. And it seems at least that the present government has become, a, if not zero tolerance, at least the low tolerance threshold of these irritants. Whereas it seems at least that in the past, because if not turn the other cheek, at least look the other way for a while. But I don't know how this will pan out in the future, where it, whether it will succeed in controlling, uh, you know, these uh, uh, irritants to our relation and build trust. We don't know. But domestically, it seems to be working to an extent, at least. But uh, thank you to Dr. Raghavan for spending your time. And if you care to send us your script, that you might want to publish it as well. So we look forward to that. And also to, to invite uh, uh, and Ranjana to come up to Shimla and, uh, you know, take a bit of rest when things improve. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.